Garente. I'm a professor of biology at MIT. Gee, um, I was actually more inclined towards uh, chemistry, maybe mathematics, uh, than biology. In fact, in high school, I never studied biology at all because I found it much too uh, soft as a science. Uh, then it was uh, characterization of uh, taxonomy and species and phyla, stuff that I found totally boring. But in college uh, at MIT, when I was a freshman, uh, I was planning to major in uh, possibly chemistry, but uh, I learned that there was this new thing called molecular biology that was just emerging and that was, it was very exciting. So I decided to, to try it out and uh, I ended up majoring in, in biology uh, while taking a lot of chemistry courses and uh, I think it was probably a very good decision because I think the life sciences really have blossomed tremendously in the past uh, 10, 20, 30 years and mm -hmm. this is really the golden age now for biology. That came a little bit later so I had been on the faculty uh, at MIT for about six, seven years. I had tenure and uh, it gave me an opportunity to think about doing something a little bit risky, uh, sort of high risk, uh, high reward. And I spent several years thinking what are some problems out there in biology now that would fit into that category. And uh, I thought about a lot of things, uh, including learning and memory. And I thought aging was, was interesting because obviously it's extremely important and it wasn't uh, being studied systematically. It was being studied uh, from the point of view of uh, comparing old and young uh, and mainly in the medical community. But in terms of the aging process itself and moreover what might control the aging process, there wasn't very much known. There was a little bit known but not much. So it looked like a, a perfect opportunity. Uh, but one that, that had considerable risk. What made me uh, decide to actually uh, get into it is it turned out, so my lab was at that point uh, studying uh, the organism yeast and I was uh, a yeast biologist and we had studied various aspects of cell and molecular biology uh, in yeast and that's really what gained me tenure at MIT. And it turned out that yeast cells get old, they age. So this was, a, for me, a perfect entry point to the problem. We could uh, begin by studying how yeast cells get old, and that's what we did. Now we started uh, uh, bashing away at this problem uh, in yeast uh, with the idea that we could find genes, single genes, that could confer extra longevity to yeast cells that are dividing. So when yeast cells divide, uh, this is baker's yeast that I'm talking about, the kind of yeast you would use to make bread or wine or spirits. And it turns out they're a very, very good system to study in the laboratory uh, to look at cell biology. Now when these cells divide, what you get, interestingly, of course, you get two cells from one cell, but they're different. One is called the mother cell, and it's big, and the other is called the daughter cell, and it's small. And it turns out the daughter cell is all newly synthesized. All the material in the daughter is new. But the mother cell uh, retains the old stuff. So that mother cell will then give another daughter and another daughter. And every generation, it will be getting older. And it does that about 20 times. And then it hits the wall and senesces. OK, so, that, so it really, uh, there really was aging, albeit in a, a very Baroque system. So we thought we would be able to make some headway potentially in identifying at least what controls this process in this uh, uh, exotic uh, system. And that's, that's really what intrigued me. I, I had, uh, uh, at that point, uh, no uh, uh, plan to study aging more generally than yeast. That came as we got deeper and deeper into the problem. Well, I think the problem, uh, yes, I think the problem with this field and what has bedeviled this field over the years is false claims. And there are all kinds of things uh, that have been claimed about uh, 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 ways you can slow down or stop aging. And 
what I would say they have in common uh, is that, you know, an, until uh, anything uh, that was uh, claimed that's not based on very recent science is not true. It's baloney. And um, so I wouldn't believe any claim uh, uh, of an anti-aging procedure uh, and uh, would really look at claims that are grounded in current science because I think the science of aging has really only taken off in the past decade and it ha has reached a level of uh, uh, quality that you can trust it and that it would lead to, to interventions that would actually work. That's only happened recently. So the, the thing to look at in any claim like this vitamin or that uh, treatment or that uh, 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 bath, whatever it may be, or cream, is is it based on the recent science of aging or not? And if it's not, I would tend uh, not to believe it. Even if it is, I would look at whether it's based on good science uh, or not. But there is some good science now in the area of aging. No. No, I think that uh, what they're saying is, is uh, it's a good example, I think, of something that's not based on uh, recent science in the field of aging. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that uh, there's any reason to believe that it's true. I mean, it, it may turn out that it is true. I mean, his basic idea is we're going to make incremental discoveries in aging that will make us live a little bit longer and give us a little bit more time to make the next discovery, which will make us live still longer, and then we'll make more discoveries, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be great, but uh, that's certainly not scientific thinking and that's not based on, on current science. So I think that what we're talking about, if you look at all the genetic interventions um, that have been described, and we should really get into discussing uh, some of that in a few minutes, and all the dietary interventions that have been described that promote longevity, uh, what you're looking at is something like uh, 50% as a, a, a maximum uh, extension, I would, I would think. So it's nothing to sneeze at. And uh, it's, we think, uh, accompanied by an increase in the number of years we stay healthy. And if we can tap into that and even develop it so that we get some of the benefit, let's say 10 years of healthier living, so instead of having to retire and uh, uh, stop uh, functioning at a, a high level at age 70 or 75, you push that back now 10 years. I think that's a, a major uh, uh, change in our society. Aging process, uh, you can describe it statistically in terms of uh, mortality uh, curves and uh, what that means is that the probability of uh, dying increases uh, with your age. And the reason is that there's a degenerative process that's occurring in cells and tissues that makes uh, uh, you uh, increasingly less robust as you get older and uh, opens up the doors to diseases of aging, the major diseases, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and uh, you know, eventually will kill you. So uh, it's a very pervasive uh, uh, process that has many, many things going wrong all at the same time. Well, you're, you're talking to somebody who is uh, not unbiased uh, in this area. And, um, you know, I think the sirtuins have really been, to my mind, uh, the a completely unexpected uh, new thing to come along. Now, this came from the studies in yeast that I described a few minutes ago, where we were looking for anti-aging genes. And after about nine years of doing this, the first nine years, we started working in this area about 19 years ago. The first nine years were spent in yeast trying to find uh, the right gene, and we came upon a gene called SIR2. And the, the SIR2 gene was an anti-aging gene. And what I mean by that is when you made it more active, the cells 
lived longer. They divided more times. When you made it less active, they lived less long. So this looked like a really interesting gene, and it was the only gene that we came across that did this. And so, so we thought it was interesting. Then we carried out a similar kind of study uh, in a different organism that people study in the lab, the roundworm, C. elegans. And again, we're looking, are there any genes in the genome of C. elegans that are anti-aging genes? And we got the same gene. We got a gene that has the same sequence, similar sequence, as the yeast SIR2. So that's an amazing finding because what it means is if the SIR2 gene is counteracting aging in yeast and in worms, that it's doing that universally. And that would include mammals and it would include us. So it really right away speaks to a universality of this process. So I think that's one thing that's highly significant about this is that the gene is conserved and we think its effect on the aging process is conserved. Now, the piece of this that makes it, I think, particularly exciting is you say, well, okay, there's this gene uh, that uh, makes you live longer if it's more active. Why, why, why should that be? What does this gene actually do? Okay? And what we know is genes, of course, uh, are the blueprint to specify proteins, and the SIR2 genes encode particular proteins. The proteins are called sirtuins, okay? And we're really, really eager to try and figure out what the sirtuins actually did in cells. And just almost exactly 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, we discovered it. And they have an enzymatic activity in cells that enables them to modify other proteins in cells. And that can really change the metabolism, the physiology of a cell, and then by extension of entire tissues and an entire organism. But the critical thing about this activity is that it was completely coupled to this small metabolic molecule in cells called NAD. So the activity of sirtuins, which is called deacetylation of other proteins, is absolutely under control of NAD. No NAD, sirtuins are dead. Okay, so that NAD links sirtuins to diet and metabolism because diet and metabolism affect the availability of NAD in cells. So we came up with a hypothesis 10 years ago when we discovered this activity that sirtuins might be, really be the link between how diet affects how long you live and how diet affects your predisposition to diseases. And this is a, it was a, a I think, a radical uh, idea. I think there are a lot of people out there still critical, don't believe it. Um, but I think the data is mounting in mice, particularly, that says that this may actually be true. And so the idea would be uh, that on a low calorie diet, a diet that's been termed calorie restriction, we know that rodents live longer and they resist diseases. They're disease free under this diet. And we suggest that the reason for that, at least one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, is that this low calorie diet activates sirtuins via this molecule NAD and that the more active sirtuins uh, then promote better survival and better ability to ward off diseases. So that's a very simple uh, hypothesis that came from identifying this activity that I, I mentioned. So that's one. Second thing that came out of that is once you have an understanding of what a protein does, and you can actually measure that in a test tube now that just has that protein, and in this case, NAD. It enables you to screen for drugs, for small molecules that can enhance that activity. And it opened the door for looking for small molecules that could upregulate the activity of sirtuins. And that's led to sort of a, a flood of, uh, uh, of interest. I think probably the part of the story that's gotten the greatest notice in the press. So the first uh, screens that were done identified a molecule uh, found in red wine called resveratrol, 
that's of a class of uh, compounds that plants make in response to stress. They're called polyphenols. And these compounds could activate uh, the sirtuin in a test tube. And they also could make cells live longer, yeast cells, and could make worms live longer. So the remarkable thing uh, seemed to be that not only are sirtuins able to do this, but we might actually be able to influence their activity uh, from outside with drugs. And that really is, uh, I think, where the uh, excitement began and is still uh, building because I think that this is still not completely appreciated yet. So that was, these are natural products, the resveratrol and uh, the polyphenols, the things that are found in wine. But a company was started uh, by uh, David Sinclair and Christoph Westfall called Sertris about uh, six years ago to try and look for new kinds of molecules now that are not uh, natural products, they're not found in nature, by screening through libraries of different chemical compounds that have been synthesized. And there are new kinds of activators now of sirtuins, new chemicals that can activate them much more potently than resveratrol. And it's going to be extremely exciting to test these molecules and see what they'll do. So far, what we know is both resveratrol and some of these newer compounds uh, have beneficial effects in mice. And what they do in mice, they've been tested against uh, various diseases. So what we would expect is if these molecules are really activating sirtuins and can protect against diseases of aging, then we should be able to demonstrate that in a mouse. So it turns out if you feed a mouse uh, basically a bad diet, the opposite of a calorie-restricted diet, so a diet high in fat, high in calories, the mice get diabetes. Okay. Now it turns out these molecules, resveratrol and the newer compounds that activate the sirtuins, they can protect the mouse against diabetes. So the mouse will still eat a lot. The mouse will still even get fat, okay, but will stay metabolically healthy. So that's a pretty good demonstration that uh, uh, this idea is not so far out, uh, but that there really is an opportunity here to use drugs to keep metabolism strong and intact as in the face of uh, uh, caloric excess, okay? But even more importantly, for many of us, like myself, who already, uh, I don't calorie restrict, but I don't eat to excess either, so I'm in good shape. But even someone like myself would be able to get benefit from these, uh, these molecules by activating sirtuins, in addition to the benefit that I'm already getting by keeping myself in good shape. So I think it's, very, uh, uh, it's a very promising area of research. And this company, uh, this small company called Sertris, was uh, bought by one of the giants in the pharmaceutical industry, GSK, for something like three quarters of a billion dollars a year ago. So obviously that, uh, uh, there's at least some uh, uh, validation in big pharma that these ideas uh, are uh, realistic and will be brought to fruition. Well, I think, we, well, you know, my lab works on really on sirtuins, and I think there's so much to be done. So what we know now is just a, a, the tip of the iceberg about sirtuins. So first of all, there are seven of them in people, okay? And so far, most of the studies have been focused on just one of those seven. Second of all, there are many tissues that have to be studied. So we know what the sirtuins are doing in each and every tissue so that we know what the effects of a drug are going to be tissue by tissue. Uh, and that's going to take a long time. So we're deeply involved in that. The third thing is, will these sirtuins really protect against many diseases or will they just protect against metabolic diseases like diabetes? So my lab is really focus, focused now on neurodegenerative diseases and we're testing the effect of activating uh, the, the major uh, human sirtuin, which is called SIRT1, which has also been called the survival gene. Uh, and we're interested in, what if we activate this in the brain? Will it protect a mouse against Alzheimer's disease, against Parkinson's disease, against Huntington's disease? And I think these are extremely important questions because they'll define the scope of uh, uh, what we're able to think about here and what we can uh, start to attack pharmacologically. 
Well, I mean, I, I think a low calorie diet is probably a good thing. Um, I, I think in humans, we don't know, there's no data on what a low calorie diet does in terms of diseases and uh, longevity, as I said before. Uh, by analogy to rodents, uh, you would think it would be a good thing. On the other hand, uh, if it made you really miserable to eat a thousand calories a day, uh, and people who are on that diet tend to be cold, they tend to uh, have very low sex drive, they tend to, uh, in some cases, uh, be irritable. And so if you're not happy, then that gets back to what we were saying earlier. You may be undoing some of the good uh, that that diet uh, would otherwise uh, produce. So my feeling is to live sensibly. I mean, the word, word of advice that I think uh, is good, it's hard to follow, but I think what everybody should do, if everybody could do this, uh, it, it's the best you can do right now, is decide what is your perfect weight, your body weight. What's perfect for you? And I think what most people do is rifle through the past <laughs> And, and, and decide on you know, when they were most happy uh, with themselves and do everything possible to get to that weight and keep to it. And I think that that would uh, uh, necessarily uh, make you healthier, most people healthier than they are now. Uh, beyond that, I, you know, I take a vitamin supplement, a general supplement. Uh, I take vitamin D. Um, I do not take resveratrol, though a lot of people do. Um, and the reason is I'm waiting for a 100% pure and reliable source of it, and then I will take it. Um, and uh, I drink a little wine, and uh, all the data says, again, there's an optimum. I think the data says that too much wine is bad, but no wine is not optimum, the right amount of wine. Uh, is optimum. There's a center in Louisiana called the Pennington Center that has been uh, doing such studies. It's been a long time since there's been good data on humans on uh, calorie restriction and part of the problem has been that uh, humans tend to cheat on the diet so uh, controlled studies end up not being so controlled. Uh, but recently there have been six-month studies done and what you can do in six months, you can't ask if it's making people live longer, you can't even ask if it's protecting them against diseases, but you can ask if it's eliciting the kinds of physiological changes that you expect in calorie restriction, which would be a loss of body fat, a lowering of blood glucose, so an anti-diabetic uh, effect, uh, a, a rendering of uh, sensitivity to insulin, the action of insulin, these can all be measured. And six months on calorie restriction in humans does roughly the same thing that it does in mice. Now, just one footnote on uh, one of those studies. So, in rodents, uh, what we knew is that uh, some of these sirtuin activators could activate uh, muscle to process glucose better. And it was doing that, at least in part, by activating uh, the synthesis of mitochondria. These are organelles in cells. They're called the powerhouses of cells that make energy for cells. And by activating mitochondria, uh, you sort of drive metabolism and you drive the uptake of glucose from the blood into the muscle and the processing of glucose. So it's a good thing. It's an anti-diabetic thing. And this process is, uh, it can be driven by SIRT1, the survival gene in muscle in rodents. Now, it was done first with resveratrol, but it turns out calorie restriction in rodents does the same thing. You activate the synthesis of mitochondria in muscle, okay, and that makes them more metabolically active, and it's a good thing metabolically. Okay, now to get back to the humans, what they were able to show uh, in this trial is they took uh, punch biopsies of muscle from the people that were on the calorie restriction diet for six months, and what they found in their muscles was an increase in mitochondria, and an increase in the levels of the SIRT1 protein. The protein was actually increased uh, in the muscle in response to calorie restriction. So that says that the congruence between uh, uh, mice and humans may be uh, uh, quite profound.
with regard to calorie restriction. So we can't say any, there's no direct evidence in humans about diseases, certainly not about lifespan, but at least basic physiology uh, uh, looks like it might be similar in humans. So that might uh, make a good prediction about uh, the effects of uh, calorie restriction, but nobody wants to practice calorie restriction because it's, it's so unpleasant. And so what everybody would like is a mimetic, a drug that would el elicit at least some of the benefits of calorie restriction. Well, I would say uh, smoking would be one. Uh, eating too caloric excess would be another. Um, being sedentary, uh, not moving around, not exercising would be a third. We didn't talk about exercise, but there's ample evidence that exercise uh, is beneficial. Um, I think the other thing is what we were just talking about, your attitude and mindset. I think, you know, uh, being focused on negativity would be a fourth. And I think the last one, uh, which again, is, would, would be uh, more or less in this lifestyle uh, area, would be stress level, the, the level of stress that you maintain on a day-to-day -day basis. So I believe, and others uh, uh, believe, in something called hormesis. And what hormesis means is that a lot of stress is a bad thing, but no stress is also a bad thing. And the optimum is something in the middle so that you're engaged on a daily basis, you're revved up, you're functioning, okay, but you feel as though you're in control. And I think finding that balance, that hormesis, uh, is, is probably very important in maintaining uh, mental health and physical health. So that would be my, my big five. Well, I would say uh, smoking would be one. Uh, eating too caloric excess would be another. Um, being sedentary, uh, not moving around, not exercising would be a third. We didn't talk about exercise, but there's ample evidence that exercise uh, is beneficial. Um, I think the other thing is what we were just talking about, your attitude and mindset. I think, you know, uh, being focused on negativity would be a fourth. And I think the last one, uh, which again is, would, would be uh, more or less in this lifestyle uh, area, would be stress level, the level of stress that you maintain on a day-to-day -day basis. So I believe in others uh, uh, believe in something called hormesis. And what hormesis means is that a lot of stress is a bad thing, but no stress is also a bad thing. And the optimum is something in the middle so that you're engaged on a daily basis, you're revved up, you're functioning, okay, but you feel as though you're in control. And I think finding that balance, that hormesis, uh, is, is probably very important in maintaining uh, mental health and physical health. So that would be my, my big five. I, I think that at least for the aging field, uh, one uh, disappointment, I would say, that I've had is that Aging is fundamental to so many diseases, yet I really think it's, it's underfunded in terms of uh, an approach to treating these diseases. And uh, to give you an example, I think the past 10 to 20 years has been an amazing time in the field of aging. But the fraction of the NIH budget that goes to research on aging hasn't changed over that period. And um, to me, that's disappointing because I think that, that this is a, a, a one uh, leverage point to really improve human health. 
I'm not sure anything is overfunded, to be perfectly honest. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, at least most major areas uh, of research uh, that I know of are meritorious. And, um, you know, if you review grants, uh, usually, uh, the number of grants uh, you see that are worthy of funding far exceeds uh, the number that actually get funded. So, you know, I, I, I'm not saying, I, I realize it's a, a ultimately a zero-sum game, but um, I do think that aging in particular probably uh, is a little bit underfunded now. I think the U.S. has always been uh, the best country in terms of encouraging innovation. And I think, you know, the, the, the rise of the NIH and the granting system uh, after uh, World War II to now uh, is, is a really good example of that. And I know when I was a young scientist, uh, you know, people would apply for grants and they weren't so hard to get. You know, the fraction funded maybe was 25 percent, something like that. And so that you could propose things that were a little bit uh, out of the box and have a chance of getting funded to do it, which encourages innovation. I think now, once things become uh, so tight and instead of 25 percent, you have 10 percent of grants funded, then I think, you know, any, any grant that uh, seems the least bit risky is not going to be funded. And I think uh, you tend to encourage uh, sort of precise, uh, uh, calculated uh, science uh, at the expense of creative science. So historically, this country has been the best. I think I'm a little concerned now that that might be uh, uh, trailing off, although I can't uh, uh, offhand tell you that it's better any other place. I think one hero I would mention uh, is Galileo. And the, re the reason for that, and the reason I think, at least to my mind, uh, he's the greatest scientist is the, the way we do science now is to actually have ideas that we can test with experiments. And it's, this, it's called the scientific method, so critical to making science more than philosophy. And I think in earlier uh, civilizations, the Greeks, the Romans, the greatest minds, the philosophers, uh, they just sort of intuited things. You know, here's the way things must be. Uh, and of course, that's a, a recipe for making a lot of mistakes and for having a, a false impression of the world. And what Galileo did was to say, okay, I have an idea, but I think the way to go is to do experiments and uh, to test the ideas. And that, I think, is is the bedrock upon which uh, modern science is built. Also, I mean, uh, he, he took a lot of heat for what he did in his lifetime uh, from the Catholic Church, and, uh, and he was operating under a pretty extreme circumstances. And given those circumstances, I think he performed pretty darn well. I think one dilemma uh, you always have is um, our profession really depends on our being able to publish our work in peer-reviewed journals. So what gets published has really been uh, uh, gone over with a fine-tooth comb. And so we review each other's papers. And you have to decide when you have a conflict of interest or not. And if someone's work is too close to yours, if they're a competitor, I think you have to stay away from it because there's an obvious conflict of interest. A little bit less obvious, uh, if you have people uh, whose, uh, the people whose papers, uh, who wrote the papers are from your lab, they're former postdocs or students, I think that's also a, a, a conflict of interest. And I think it's, uh, it's a, a, there are gray areas work that's sort of close to your work, but I mean, where, where do you draw the line of when it's okay to review someone else's work, be it a paper or a grant, uh, and when is it not? And when is 
self-interest uh, creeping in. And, um, you know, I think it's very important that the peer uh, review process, uh, this is the best thing we have, uh, that it be uh, as pure as possible. It's never going to be perfect, but I think it's worth uh, thinking about. And, uh, and it, poses, it poses dilemmas on a regular basis.